Good morning, CCY family. How are you doing today? Yeah, some vocal feedback. I like hearing that. I'm excited to be up here in front of you today to continue this series, to dive into Acts chapter 17 and what a great one has been put on my desk, and I'm excited about it. Going into a message that I titled Examining the Truth when we take a look at Acts chapter 17, but I wanted to try something a little bit different this morning, something that we've actually been doing on Wednesday nights with our teenagers, and we call it the Fellowship minute, right? The fellowship minute. It's such an interesting idea what church can be sometimes, how it has changed through the years and how we go about it as a modern society in 2018 where everyone has a crazy life with so much going on, but yet we still somehow end up together every single Sunday with people that we love and people who are our family but it's kind of interesting sometimes. I've been in this church for quite some time, and I have came here every single Sunday almost that I could for maybe, I don't know, eight or nine, ten years. And I've seen a lot of you every single week over and over again. But there are some people in this room right now that I might have seen on a weekly basis over a hundred times, and I don't know who they are. And that's so weird to me. That's so odd because if I were to see the same person over a hundred times in any other capacity, most likely I've talked to them by now. And you could say that's on my fault and rightfully so. But the fellowship minute was an idea to combat this complacency in the kind of like social environment and fellowship environment of our church. And we've been doing it every single Wednesday night so far in our youth services over in the other building. But it simply starts our service by saying we're going to intentionally take four or five minutes to create small little groups together in the room and just talk and discuss something, right? And how we've been doing this, um, kind of a theme of our message series in the other building has all been in threes, right? We were talking about being intertwined in the Bible and we're talking about um, different verses that have to do with the number three. So we've been breaking into groups of three, literally standing up out of our seats, groups of three, and then a question is prompted onto the screen and you just have four or five minutes to discuss it with someone in front of you. It starts started so casual and so simple. The first question on that first Wednesday night was simply, what is your favorite movie? So easy. You can learn so much about another person through their interests. And as someone who is passionate about a lot of hobbies, I want to know about other people's interests. I like to see where their passions are. I like to see how they take their free time and apply it to things that they like. So that was such an easy question to begin with. What is your favorite movie? And it was like people would start saying, this is my favorite movie. And then it had a few like sub questions underneath it. It'd be like, why is it your favorite movie? When was the first time you've seen it? How many times do you think you've seen it? And your life. And honestly, I don't want to admit how many times I've seen Lethal Weapon 3 in my life, but it's up there and we had to discuss it, right? And the next week was uh, also another kind of silly question. It was, if you were able to travel in time, would you go back in time or would you go forward in time? What would you do? Who would you see? What would you watch, right? And the history nerd inside of me and my friend Dakota Jones, who was a history teacher um, in our school system, had a great time with that question. But um, today, let's put a little more biblical spin on this. So we're going to try this fellowship minute in here. I know, it's crazy. I'm going to ask you to stand up. So if uh, people who can, if you can, stand up at this moment, right? We are going to create small little groups just around you, the people who are sitting around you, groups of three or four. And over these next four or five minutes, please bear with me, next four or five minutes, I would like for you to discuss this question on the screen. What is the most challenging part of the Bible to you? What makes it so challenging? And how do you study and approach it over the ne these next four or five minutes? I invite you to discuss this with your church family. All right, as you are finishing up your discussions. 
You may make your way back to your seat. And what a great way is this to just create an environment of relationships. Maybe going out of your way to talk to someone that you've never talked to before and then you find out that you share something in common to them and then who knows where it can go from there. And that is the idea of the Fellowship Minute, right? So this morning, we're going to be jumping into Acts chapter 17. If you have your Bibles or Bible apps, this would be the time to uh, get that out and make your way over to Acts chapter 17. Um, This morning, I will be mispronouncing plenty of Greek words, so uh, we can have some fun with that this morning, but um, mind my Greek. I don't even know if I can say the words my Greek. Mind the Greek that I will attempt um, with, with some of these cities and names. But um, in Acts chapter 17, if you are making your way there, I'm going to go ahead and start reading. This is what we're going to be focusing on. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and I'm totally saying that incorrectly, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As what was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few of prominent women. Uh, Verse 5 right here. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. And the part that I really want to focus on is in these next few verses. So we're in Acts chapter 17, verse 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Beraria. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. So they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. And what I want to look at this morning is in verses 11 and 12. For they received the message with great eagerness, and this word right here, examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. These people did not take what Paul was claiming to them with face value, but instead they approached the scriptures and examined it and searched for the truth. They examined the truth, right? And as I was reading about this and studying, I came across um, the correspondence theory of truth. And in Christian philosophical terms, this is simply a very fancy way that philosophers like to claim this is true and this is false. And this is how we know this is true. And this is how we know this is false, right? The correspondence theory of truth, as from Stanford's Encyclopedia of Philosophy claims, narrowly speaking, The correspondence theory of truth is the view that truth is correspondence to or with a fact, a view that was advocated by Russell and Moore early in the 20th century. But the label is usually applied much more broadly to any view explicitly embracing the idea that truth consists in a relation to reality, that truth is a relational property involving a characteristic relation. So as we ignore all these philosophy semantics and get to the simple terms, this correspondence theory of truth simply is a statement is true if and only 
if it is made true by a fact based in reality. For something to be true, it has to be based on a fact that is in reality, that is real, that is in our lives, that we can see, that we can test, that is tangible. That is the idea here. And a lot of Christian philosophers and apologetics um, leaders will apply this correspondence theory of truth to the Bible. Because if we are going to take this 2,000-year-old book and apply it to our everyday lives where it affects us in such an impactful way, we better know it's true. And looking back in Acts 17, these people, when they heard Paul claiming that Jesus was the Messiah, at first they didn't just go, okay, sure, or okay, no. They said, let's examine this. Let's figure this out. Let's make sure this is true. So I don't watch local news very often. I struggle with it. Um, yesterday evening, I, I actually turned on the local news with my father to watch it because I missed the OU football game yesterday afternoon. And I heard a lot about it and saw some on the internet, but I wanted to watch the highlights. So we turned on local news and waiting for the highlights so I can see what happened and then go to sleep. And that was what I was planning on doing. And the local news was, well, it's like how the local news usually was. It was sad story after sad story after sad story. And I understand we have a we need to present those and be public with some of the things that are happening in our communities, but it's hard to watch sometimes. And as we got past these sad stories, we finally got to some more casual stories as we're about to get to the sports hour. And I see a story on the parking situation at the University of Central Oklahoma, UCO in Edmond. I went to UCO for a year and the parking situation just brought back some memories. So uh, UCO is a public school that in their marketing and admissions, they just love to brag about how they are a commuter school. That is their term. They are a commuter school. And it's actually statistically true. It's like over 60% of UCO students don't live on campus and they drive to campus and live somewhere else. Commuter school. I I was one of those commuters. I was a part of that statistic. And I had classes throughout the entire day, but I started off with an eight, eight in the morning class on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays. So I left Yukon usually way too late than I should have, drove way too fast on the turnpike, had the sun in my eye, but somehow, some way I would make it to class the majority of the time. And as I made it to this school and came across this parking lot, there usually was not many spots. And this was five years ago. This school is growing at a rate of two to five percent, or two to five percent every single year. With that, the tuition grows as well. And but as the amount of students has gone up, the amount of parking spots has not. And this is a very busy part of Edmond. There's a lot of shops and stores around, and there's only so much room around this campus. And the crazy part about it is to be a UCO student, especially as a commuter, every single year you have to buy a $100 parking pass. Actually, it says on the little sticker, parking permit, as if this little sticker is permitting me to park and go to class. But there's one problem. UCO does not have enough parking places for the amount of students they have. So much that students are parking off campus and Edmond Police has started giving tickets to students parking off campus. So imagine being 19 years old, late for class, going to a final, you have thousands of dollars in tuition on the line, and you are just nervous as can be, and you get to the college that you go to, and there's nowhere to park, and you have five minutes to get inside that building. So the usual 19-year-old says, I'll park at that pizza place down the street, and they come back to a ticket. And the funniest part to me is that this sticker says, parking permit as if it permits me to park at this college. But it's just not true. Because if you don't get there at six in the morning, there's no places left. There's nowhere to park. 
And this whole idea of permitting me to park, even though I paid $100 for a sticker to put on my windshield, just isn't based in reality. It's not true. It's not true. In simple terms, a correspondence theory of truth is a statement is true if and only it is made true by a fact based in reality. So let's distinguish two things real quickly. There is meaning and there is truth. Right? And as we study the Bible, you probably ask yourself, is this true? Was there really a flood that flooded this entire earth? Was there really a giant wooden built ark with all of these animals on it? You've probably asked yourself over and over again as you read the Bible narrative, you have asked yourself, is this true, right? So the word meaning and the word truth, and let's distinguish the difference, right? We can learn about concepts. As Christians, we can learn about the concept of Allah from Islam. We know the meaning of Allah. And just as we can learn and study about the concept of Allah, a non-believer away from the Christian faith can learn the concepts of Jesus Christ. They can learn the Son of God. They can learn about the Trinity. They can learn about the resurrection. They can learn about these ideas and maybe even the character of Jesus, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they subscribe to the idea that Jesus Christ was real and really did what he claimed that he did. That's the same thing with us as Christians as we study Islam. We can understand the concepts of Allah. We can know the meaning of Allah, but that doesn't necessarily mean there is an Allah. The question is, does it correspond to an objective reality? Right? And within this theory of trying to ask, is this true? There's a few things at play. An idea called a truth maker. I thought this was interesting. You know, philosophers are really good at taking something that seems like it's so simple and then making it really complicated, right? So as we ask ourselves, is this true? We look at things that are called truth makers. So the first statement that I'm going to make is I have a pen. I have a pen, that's my claim. And you might ask, is that true? The truth maker in this situation and in my statement and my argument is this pen right here. What makes it a truth maker? Well, the truth maker is the pen simply because the reason it is true that I'm claiming I have a pen is because, well, this is a pen and it is mine. Truth maker is based in reality. I can grab it. It's right here. I can show you. I can show various people. Everyone can look to this pen and all agree yeah, that's true. Justin has a pen, and it's Justin's pen. So therefore, he does have a pen. This seems so simple, and it seems so silly that we're breaking down these concepts to the absolute most simplistic ideas, and then just going, if X is Y, then Y is X, and so on and so forth. But as we read the Bible, we must do this. Right? The truth maker theory claims that every truth has a truth maker. Or alternatively, for every truth, there is something that makes it true. For Jesus Christ to die and rise again through the resurrection on the cross, and for us to claim that is true, we must have truth makers. This is why apologetics and having a way to defend our faith is important in the church in 2018. But why does this all matter? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see Paul writing, verses 14 through 19. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Talk about blunt. I'm going to say that again. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. That's in the New International Version of the Bible. And so is your faith. More than that, We are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. 
For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. What a statement. I'm going to say it one more time in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. I talk about this with the teenagers a lot. When we study things that are outside of the resurrection, the way that I try to approach things like creationism, the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, is it is important for us to study this. And it's fantastic that we are studying this. But if I'm wrong about how exactly God created the world, and it's slightly different than what I thought it was, so be it. But if I'm wrong about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that holds many more implications. Because it all boils back to the truth of the resurrection. And Paul is arguing this in Acts chapter 17. He is claiming to Jewish synagogues that Jesus has risen, risen from the dead. I can't even say it right now, but he's risen from the dead. And they are saying, let's examine this. They examine the scriptures. They come to the conclusion that Paul is telling the truth. And they become believers. Truth must be examined. We must come to the conclusion that it is true, just like I did with this pen. Because tradition does not simply equal truth. You know, church is deeply rooted in tradition. We have done some of the same things over and over and over again. And when you ask someone why we do this, they're just like, because we do it? Because we've always done it? Because we do that on Sundays? Tradition does not simply equal truth. While it could be very important, and I believe that church tradition is important, should be studied, should, we should carry it out, but what it really comes back to is the truth. You know, one of my favorite um, musicians and group of musicians is progressive rock band Rush from Canada have a lyric in an album that was actually released 40 years ago this past week simply says the men who hold high places must be the ones who start to mold a new reality closer to the heart i'll read that one more time the men who hold high places must be the ones who start to mold a new reality closer to the heart I listen to this song, I hear the lyrics, and I think to myself, how can this be applied to my church? Because I love this place, and I want it to grow, and I want it to just blow up in success, and Christ to just be so involved with the vision of our church. And I see a lot of wisdom in this lyric, and I know that when um, Neil Pert, the writer of this lyric, wrote this, he was not thinking about a church in Oklahoma 40 years later, probably not at all. But for some reason, I read it and I think, well, how can this be applied to my church? I feel like there's some wisdom in it. You know, when we look at a church, we look at a group of believers, there's always leadership. Always. It's just a human, natural reaction. Some people will be more involved than others when it comes to the preparation, when it comes to the execution, when it comes to simple things like just cleaning up the carpet. There's leadership. Leadership must set the culture of a church. And this simply doesn't only apply in just churches. This applies in so many places. And as college football has just begun, you will hear a lot about leadership and culture and how a coach or, or a manager or even like some sort of leader in these teams, they set a culture. You'll hear the term winning culture being used a lot, especially when it comes to the Oklahoma Sooners. You'll hear the words winning culture. And it's this idea that if you are a part of this organization, if you walk into this building or if you have some sort of role in this, there's some expectations. A winning culture. How do you come to that? Oh, you is deeply rooted in tradition. 
but there are a lot of football programs that are deeply rooted in tradition. Doesn't necessarily mean they win a lot. But OU has created this winning culture. And I'm just using that as an example because it's close to home. And simply because college football has just started and it's on my mind right now. But how many different other capacities in our lives do we see this idea of a winning culture? Usually the tone is set by a select few leaders. But it doesn't stop there. It simply doesn't stop there. Leadership must set the culture. But the church much, must fulfill God's vision. Right, because what is a football coach without his players? He can say over and over again in speeches that we're going to go out and win this many games because we are this team, and that's what we do. We go out and win. We go about our business in the right way, so on and so forth. But if the players don't go out and perform, is there really a winning culture? Or are those just words? And as our leadership sees the vision and the future of our church. They make decisions, they make statements that we pray, hope and pray are based in reality, in truth, and in the Bible. They can give it to you, but you have to perform in a similar way to the football players. Because the church is more than just a few people claiming to be leadership. The church is all of us. It takes all of us to be a part of this. Leadership must set the culture, but the church must fulfill God's vision. So as I read Acts chapter 17, and I see these uh, men and women, and it's so beautiful that it is written here that, that the women are actually highlighted as well, which is such an anomaly for a 2,000-year-old book set in this culture and in this time to actually have the women highlighted for searching for truth in the Bible. And how beautiful is that? But I'm reading this, and I see our church, and it is my hope, and it is my prayer prayer that when we come across difficulties in the Bible, you may even call them problem passages that you read and you just think, is this true? Or how does this work? Or this is challenging that we search for the truth. Because as we search for the truth in the Bible, we are re really just reaching to be closer to God. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, I just, it is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this church in such a capacity as I am, God, and I just thank you for that. I claim that because, God, I want you to raise new leaders all across our church in partnership with our leadership now, God, as we thrust into a new era, a new time in our church, God. We want to examine the truth, see your will, and follow it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Wonder if we, wonder if we here at CCY are of noble character. If the Apostle Paul were to come and visit and then write a letter, or Luke were coming to visit and write a letter about us, would he say, but the people of CCY were of noble character, <clears throat> more than many other places. Why? They examine the scriptures once in a while to see if oh no that's not what it says is it they examine the scriptures every day let's stand together and as a church that wants very much to make God's word foundational is this true I don't know let's take a look at the word and see in this church, it's not let's go ask the preacher or I'll go ask my Sunday school teacher. Now that's fine to do that. But the priority, the supreme authority would be a better way to say it, is the word of God, isn't it? What does God's word say? And uh, 
as a congregation we want to be committed to that perhaps you want to be committed to that and uh, want to be part of a congregation that is and that's something that we just invite you to of course that's what intro to ccy friends is, is about but we also have what we call a decision time at the close and we're about to enter into that songs getting ready to be sung and it'll be an opportunity well it'll be an opportunity for prayer if you want to to, to go for prayer and, and pray uh, with the holdens there in the back or you wanted to just come to the kind of the altar here at the front and pray with others um, it's an invitation to that and it's an invitation to make Jesus Lord because that's what the scriptures say that Jesus Christ is Lord and if you need to make that commitment that's number one above all everything else or maybe a commitment to make CCY your church home so let's just put it out there and let this message about the truth of God's word and examining that just kind of sink a little deeper while we're led in song.